for anyone watching the stream. Uh, we're going to start in a few minutes. Hi everyone, um, before we start with uh, Marco's talk, uh, we have a short word of our sponsor um, from Spassi. Um, he's going to talk a bit about Spassi and wha what it's all about, so please give him uh, an applause. Hello, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, this is the mandatory talk of the sponsor. But don't worry, I'll, I'll keep it very short. Um, I'm Frick. I'm a partner and a developer at a company called, uh, called Spassi. Uh, like many of you, I am uh, active on Twitter. And I uh, blog away at uh, murze.be. Um, Spassi, my company, has been around since 2003. We create uh, websites, applications and webshops. The current team consists of four developers and one manager, so we're quite small. But we have also a, a pool of uh, freelancers that help us out. And we love creating beautiful and uh, easy to use tailor-made software. So you might wonder, why is Spassi sponsoring the local uh, user group? And to answer that, I have to talk a little bit about open source software. Um, Spassi creates a lot of it. We have now uh, uh, around 60 packages on packages, which are downloaded for around uh, uh, 150 times. And creating these packages has a, has a lot of benefits for us. We learn a lot uh, by creating them. Um, and we learn a lot by the feedback we get from, uh, from the users of our, of our packages. Uh, we're also forced to write documentation. Um, the packages uh, show the quality of our work, so there's also a commercial aspect to it as well. <laughs> and uh, because we uh, do our code in, the, in packages, it's easy to uh, update the, uh, the projects of our clients. Uh, if you want to see uh, which packages we have, you can uh, browse to our company website. Uh, to see uh, a list of the packages. Now, um, we also use a lot of uh, open source software. Our company uh, couldn't really exist without open source. Um, I've uh, named a few, few uh, uh, things here on the slide, Nginx, Laravel, Ubuntu, Elasticsearch. Uh, I'm pretty sure you use a lot of uh, those software as well. Um, and it's really amazing that all this software is free. And I think uh, the, the more open source software there is, the, the better. So we want you to create open source software as well. Now to create open source software, uh, the first thing uh, you must have is a sense of community. Because if you're coding alone, yeah, why would you open source something if there isn't something else? And uh, a user group uh, provides uh, that sense of community. Um, Carl Evans, um, that's the keynote speaker of uh, the PHP Benelux conference in a few days, he once said that the only way to get better is to surround yourself with people who know stuff you don't. Um, I think yeah, we all here use PHP, but we all know different things, so we can learn a lot from each other. At user group, uh, you have the chance to see great speakers, like tonight. And you also have the chance to, to speak yourself. Uh, organizers of user groups are always uh, searching for uh, new speakers. Um, it doesn't uh, matter which level you're on, or if you want to talk for five minutes or, or 50 minutes. Um, but not five hours, that's, that's maybe a little bit too long. Um, and this user group is the uh, it's the third meetup, so it's a pretty young uh, user group. There's still a lot of room for growth. I hope that sometime we will have all the members in in one room. Then we're going to need a, a little bit a bigger boat. Um, 
And a lot of effort is needed by the organizers, uh, Dries and Frederik. And uh, we sponsor this meetup um, uh, because we want to give them a big thumbs up and we hope that they will continue to organize a lot of meetups in the future. And for that, I want to ask for a round of applause for the organizers. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, mom. I'm famous. No, I'm just kidding. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm Marco. Uh, I'm Italian, and that's maybe why I'm so annoying people. Uh, my nickname on the internet is Akrembius. Uh For those who don't remember nicknames, especially this one, which is kind of ugly, but I invented it when I was like 10 or something. So please don't, bla don't blame me. Um, this is my avatar. Um, I work for a company called Rove. We are software consultants, much like Spati. We also build a lot of open source, but um, we are mainly uh, located around the world and we are mostly focused on Zen framework and doctrine and kind of like high level consulting. Um, I am part of the Zen framework team. I'm currently helping maintaining the framework when I have time and I build also stuff in doctrine. So if the releases are late, that's because of me. Uh, <laughs> feel free to blame me. Um, I just don't have enough time, sadly. Um, so this talk is specifically specifically about Doctrine or M. So who is using it already here? Who is not using Doctrine or M? Who doesn't know it at all? OK, that's good. All right, so, so at least it's a known project. Anyway, Doctrine project is not just the ORM. Um, Doctrine Project is a set of persistence-oriented libraries for PHP. So we deal with loading and saving stuff. That's all we do. We save to SQL, we save to MongoDB, we save to CouchDB, whatever. So we are trying to build some kind of decent API to save stuff and load stuff. Because actually that's a very complicated problem as it seems. We are looking for contributors, so if you think you have the guts, um, especially to take unpopular decisions, please join us or hit me up, send me an email or something. Not many emails, I just have way too many already. Um, but the idea is you have to be prepared to say no to contribut contributions, and it's not about making things easy for developers, it's about taking right choices and seeing a project in the long term how it's going to be working if it's going to be a stable api or if we're just adding an api for the sake of it so um a lot of the maintainer work is actually saying no sorry so be prepared for that if you want to join us um doctrine or uh, i'm just going to rehearse what it is is a jsr 317 slash hibernate inspired Mapper. Now that's the legal stuff because we take a lot of stuff from Hibernate. Actually, the ideas uh, came from there, kind of. But since it's um, GPL based, we actually had to mention them. And by the way, they are awesome people and they're working really hard on that. So kudos to them for building a kind of cool tool, except that it's for Java, which we are not using, at least most of us in here. Anyway, if you use the Hibernate API, you know uh, that it's kind of awesome. And you know that these people know what they're doing. 
So we took what they did and we built kind of something similar because it works. This is Doctrine ORM best practices. So I'm going to assume that you already know what the ORM looks like. You have some concepts about what is good design, what is bad design. We're going to look at a lot of examples. First of all, I want to be sure that you know your enemy. You need to be aware what the problems are and where they, can, they, they come from. Um, and that is most of the time tools, that's integrations. It's not stuff coming from your mind. It's something that you took from somewhere else and you use, and you probably didn't read this thing, it's the documentation. I didn't read the doctrine documentation either at the beginning. So that was my own mistake. Uh, please go and read it. Uh, knowledge is power. Not everyone agrees with that, but um, so yeah, please go and read the documentation. When is an ORM an appropriate tool? Um, first of all, we need to answer that. You don't need to slam the ORM in every project that you build. It doesn't make sense. So the ORM is well, well suited for a particular set of applications, which are called OLTP applications. Online transaction processing. Pretty much like build a shopping cart, pay for it, check out, that's it. That is an online transaction, okay? So it's about small sets of data, dealing with it in a transactional way. And, you know, it's not about dealing with big data or whatever people call big data nowadays. Um, it's for domain-driven development. Um, this is a lie, of course, because you can't do perfect DDD with Doctrine, but it enables that. Um, and for fast prototyping, we are not basing ourselves on designing all the schema details in perfection at first. Instead, we go with the object-oriented first approach. So this is where you should use this kind of ORM. If you're not going this way, then Doctrine is probably not even the good tool for it, the best tool for that, what you're doing. So uh, Doctrine ORM should absolutely not be used in contexts where you have dynamic data structures. One example of this is EAV uh, structures, entity attribute value structures. And for tasks like reporting, uh, reporting is pretty much taking big amounts of data and aggregating it and stuff like that. They invented a language for that. It's really cool. I heard that a lot of people are already adopting it and it's called SQL. Okay, that's what you should do for such a thing. It was invented somewhere in the 70s, but people started forgetting about it. Um, so just go and use it. It's a query language after all. So when you have reporting, aggregation, search operations, and so on, just use SQL, seriously. It doesn't need to be that complicated all the time. So where do we start? Assuming that you are using the ORM for the right job, let's start from entities, of course. So. Um, First thing that must be clear when designing entities is that you should design them outside the context of the ORM. Your entities must work without having the ORM in mind. Your entities should just work out of the box, even if you're just serializing and deserializing them to a file. They should just work. Entities should work even without the persistence layer. So even without serializing them or deserializing them, you should already be able to do something with these entities. In memory, of course. Um, entities are mostly representing concepts in your domain. Again, a big lie because domain-driven development is kind of big as a topic, but they are concepts that you want to represent and you want to make them, first of all, look like the concepts of the domain that you're trying to work with. The database is just a detail. It's just a very intelligent way of saving stuff that a lot of people designed in the 70s again. So you may want to save it in the, in the database, but that's just the detail. As I said, it can work with files as well. I mean, it's just not efficient, but it works. So design the entities first domain um, leads, and then the database is just the detail that comes after that. So you need to design the concepts, the interactions between the entities, and then move forward and design the database. This is the first thing that most newcomers to the ORM do wrong. They design a database and then they say, I want to reverse engineer, and they create all these entities that are generated code, 
and they look kind of like crap and they don't do anything at all. Plus they don't work with the database uh, without the database. So it's kind of weird. Um, again, mappings should also be defined after you design the entities. So once you designed how your entities work, what the interactions are, then you can focus on how every detail is saved. Like what is a string, what is an integer, what is a UID, what is an embeddable object and so on. Okay, designing entities. Looks familiar, right? Anybody writing kind of like this? Yeah, all right. Please don't, <laughs> okay. Entities are not typed arrays. If you look at this example, what we have is just username, password, getter, setter, getter, setter. This is just an array. There is no point in building this with objects, to be honest. This is probably better with just public properties. Entities are not typed arrays. Entities are supposed to have some behavior. Now this is obviously conflicted because there's a lot of people talking about performance here, performance there, and they're, they're gonna go completely nuts if you tell them that entities should have logic in them. But entities have behavior. Um, and entities are kind of guaranteeing consistency inside your system. They kind of have control over, over what is in them and they prevent invalid state from leaking in. So how the entity internal state works is irrelevant. You first need to code the interactions within the different entities. You can deal with how things are saved and stored internally later on. So you have to think about it in this way. You just design an entity and think about it, what I want this entity to do. So I'm going to add some public API to it, but how the private API looks, that's not important. That's a detail, right? Instead, if you just design state first, so you're going to just add the fields because you know your user is going to have this and that, you're going to build yourself a trap. Like You don't know if, like for example, an email address can be used as a foreign key or an identifier because you don't know if an, a, an email address is immutable. Okay, so you design the interaction, you want to get the, the email of the user, but you don't know if it's stored in the user or in the log of all the emails that a user had in the past. So this is just one example. So if you make it, you think of the email address as the primary key of an object first, for example, you're going to have some kind of constraint that is kind of a big problem when this requirement changes later on. So you design state first instead of API first. Uh, here's a better example of API first. So we have the same user, it's private fields here. Then we have a two nickname. Uh, please notice that this is a two nickname, it's not get nickname. So what I'm doing here is I'm casting my object to a string, that's kind of the idea. So this is giving the consumer of this API a different idea of what this looks like. So he's not going to assume that he's going to get some internal state. So he's instead giving a, getting a different representation of the object. So he's not going to assume that he can just get and set stuff on it. This is more of a psychological thing, by the way. Uh, then we have an authenticate method, so we can pass in a password and a check hash, which is just a callable, maybe some password hash API, and then it's gonna check if the user can be authenticated and if the user has no active bands. And then it has a change password with a new password and a hashing algorithm pass in, passed in. So you see, this is kind of like the, I wouldn't say aggregate design, but kind of. Okay, so we are, constraining state internally and we're not exposing it really. We are just allowing people to interact with us. If you don't have this kind of behavior, you don't need an ORM. You know, use a table data gateway, use arrays, use whatever light extraction that you want, but your entities should encapsulate some sort of behavior. Otherwise you're just kind of like building all this state trap that I just talked about. Now there's a lot of design kind of suggestions for me, and these come mostly from um, experience over the years, what, what works, what doesn't work. Well, law of Demeter. Um, anybody familiar with the law of Demeter? LOD, okay. Uh, not familiar with it. You don't know the law of Demeter. Okay, that's fine. No shame, really. Um, the law of Demeter is pretty much a simple rule that says you talk to your neighbor, but not to your neighbor's neighbors. Um, it's not an accurate example, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, there is this game that people play, well, kids play, 
uh, somewhere in kindergarten or when they're really, really small, um, and you say something to your the person next to you, and then person says it to the next person, and so on and so on. So on, on the input comes lion, and on the output comes snake. Okay, that happens all the times. That is a perfect representation of what the law of the meter looks like. Now think about it, you have a chain of methods and you have like foo, get bar, get buzz, get tab and so on. And you don't know what goes wrong in any of those steps. So you should always stop at the first step, you know, to ensure consistency. So here we have an example. We have a user and the user has access to resource gives us a boolean just to check if the user has access to a partic uh, particular resource. So we're using the user object as encapsulation of your role-based access control here. And what we're doing here, we are filtering, we're getting the role access levels. This is by the way, first violation. We're getting state from a second object and we're interacting with that state. And then we check if any of those access level uh, can access this resource. Okay, now, so you see that the violation here is that I'm not talking to the role, I'm not telling it, role, can you access this resource? But I'm acting on what the role knows. So I'm jumping through different levels. Now this can lead to, first of all, problems, as I said, because of the law of the meter, but it also brings uh, performance issues because we don't know if this particular access is going to cause a lot of queries or not. Maybe a huge collection of stuff but this is under the control of the role. Instead, we are accessing from the user perspective. So if we simplify it, we just get something like this. So instead of coding the interaction in the user, since the role has control over it, we're just passing it over to the other method. This kind of looks like proxying here, but that's the idea. We're simplifying the interactions. Every object just interacts with each other. It doesn't get and operate on this state. This is much, much better from many points of view. It's more expressive. I mean, this is much more readable than like looping and filtering. Um, it's much easier to test. Think about it. If you were to write the tests with the looping logic, that would be kind of hard to do. We have much less coupling. We are now coupling just with a role object. We're not coupling with the role object plus the implementation of the objects inside a collection of the role object. Uh, much more flexible, you can just change it. It's one line of code. Uh, plus you can swap the role instance on the other side. So you have an abstraction there that you depend on. It's much easier to refactor, which is kind of coming from all the four before. So this means that you disallow access to collection values from outside the entity. Um, this is more of the right problem, but the idea is following. Um, here we have a user object. Uh, we have the same kind of violation, by the way. Again, the meter violations, but so it's kind of like representing itself in different scenarios. Uh, so we have a user, and the user exposes get bands, which returns a collection, which is a doctrine collection. And then we have a public function ban user, which may be in a service layer, in a command handler, whatever. So we get a user ID, and now we can search for the user. We're finding a user by ID. Let's assume that the user is found. So I didn't add the code to check if the user was found. We'll get to that later. And then we say user get bans and we add a new ban. So first of all, I'm interacting with state of the user object. I'm violating the Demeter law and I'm acting indirectly on my object. So this is the spooky action at the distance, which means that I'm modifying the state of the bans collection and indirectly I'm modifying the user object. So this is relatively simple violation and it may not be so clear to a junior developer. So what you can do to prevent this is very, very simple. So what you do is you keep your collections hidden from um, the outside. So what you can do is here, you return this bands to array. So you dereference it. Whoever has access to the bands doesn't have a reference access to the collection, so he can't modify it or otherwise you just code a ban on the user object. Okay, so this is much simpler. Instead of getting state and modifying it, we are instead calling the ban method on the user, which is much simpler, to be honest, and the user knows how to deal with its, in its internal state. Entity validity. Uh, really? Uh, okay, a lot of people um, are doing this. 
uh, they're pretty much creating an entity and then they're validating it. Is it the state valid? This is kind of an anti-pattern because the entity's job is to keep the state internally consistent. So there is no validity. There's only Zool chopped off here, but whatever. Um, entities should always be valid. Uh, invalid state should not be transitioned inside your objects ever. If you have invalid state in your system, it should be in temporary objects. They're not yet inside your domain. Um, or if this inconsistent state is part of your domain, then give it a name. Like this is a user with a temporary email address, or this is a user while registering, or this is a submission form step one. I mean, step one is a stupid name, but you give it the name that you prefer. Invalid state should be in separate objects, therefore, which usually means DTOs. DTO is a data transfer object. To give you an idea, data transfer object it, transfer object is pretty much like an array, except that you can type hint against it. So we go back to this array syntax-ish. And um, this applies to anything that is temporary state. So you can't save anything because it's not done yet. After your entity's constructor is called, your internal state must be valid, regardless of the database. So your entity should be filled with all the data that is needed. Which means that if your entity has 20 fields and all the fields are required, this means having a 20 fields, 20 parameters constructor. And that is perfectly okay. What is interesting is that a lot of people just see more than four parameters or something like that in a method and just go like, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but they go totally apeshit on it. You know? And they say, oh my God, this is horrible design. No, seriously, if the state is that, these are your domain rules. I mean, maybe you didn't design it well, but at least the constraints should be there. And you can code it, you can group the fields, you can make value objects, you can make very, very different things to reduce the number of parameters, but you should absolutely be consistent after construct. So regardless of the database, all the fields should be in a valid state at any time after construct was called. Name constructors are a solution to that. Um, if you have an entity with a lot of fields, you want to add name constructors. And that is pretty much just a public static method from array, from form data, from this and that and that. The point of that is that you are going to add more ways of building the same object. Uh, and every time it may be different, but this way you don't have so many BC breaks. If you only have construct, then every time you add a parameter to construct your breaking API everywhere, in your application, you need to refactor it out. So name constructor are, are re really, really powerful in this context. Avoid setters. So we, didn't, we don't fiddle with the internal state of our objects, so we just don't code the setters. The, the setters are not an interaction. You are not expressing a concept. What is, what is happening during a setter operation? You're not actually doing something with the object. You're just passing data in. This is not a real interaction. So it's both a violation of OO principles and kind of a problem from a design perspective in general. It brings all this state coupling that we discussed before. Um, avoid coupling with the application layer. This is pretty much like avoid coupling with the framework or with whatever stuff happens outside your domain. Your domain is a set of rules that are very close to what the business does. How the application works, like HTTP or a mobile app or whatever, that is not really the problem of the domain. Your domain should receive data from the application, but it should not really talk to the application directly. So, um, yeah, here we have a user controller. This is kind of what is happening all the time. If you use Symfony or if you use Zen Framework, so you have a user form and you bind a user object to it. First of all, it's an empty user object, which is already kind of a violation there. Like, what does the user contain? What is it? Uh, and then here we have another thing, which is probably a bit better. We have persist user from form data with the form. Now in the first example, this is really bad. Now we have a user object that is floating around. It's not valid until the form says so. So somebody else from the outside is saying if my object is valid. You see the problem there? And in the second example, instead, this is maybe a bit better, but our user object 
knows how to interact with the form and the form is an object from the framework or from the domain, uh, sorry, from the application layer, maybe extends the framework, maybe doesn't, but still we are type hinting against the form object that comes from the outside and we don't really uh, want the type hint there because our domain should work once we remove it and the application is gone. Should still work. We should be able to migrate to new framework, new hip framework, okay? This is kind of a problem of all uh, framework components um, that actually interact with ent entities. Um, both Symfony form and Zen form are really terrible at this. I don't know about Laravel forms, but uh, that's out of my scope, uh, my knowledge. Uh, but in this use case, these forms are really, really bad. Instead, again, use a DTO as I suggested before. There's a good article by Bernard Schusek about how to use value objects and DTOs to operate with forms and you have this valid-ish object floating around and then you build the entity with this floating object, which is much better. Now more ORM specific stuff, uh, avoid lifecycle callbacks. Um, anybody using lifecycle callbacks at all? Yeah, no, it's fine, don't worry, I'm not biting. <laughs> um, lifecycle callbacks are a persistence hack. Think about it. A lifecycle callback is pretty much like serialize and unserialize, but in ORM world. Okay? Would you ever send an email when you serialize an object? Does it make sense? It doesn't, right? Would you, I don't know, send an email when you unserialize it? No. So if you're using lifecycle callbacks to command how your application works and your domain works, then you see that there's a problem there. Okay, uh, we may schedule operations that may happen in future. You know, we're pushing stuff down the line and we're telling it just check it later, you know? We're not telling it do it, we're, te we're telling it there's something new that you can't check. But serialized and unserialized are indeed intended to be kind of like serialized and unserialized replacements, but or M specific. So things like attaching an image to an, um, to an entity because the image is on Amazon S3 and not in the database, for example. This is a serialization and serialization. So we are, when we save, we upload to S3. When we load, we load from S3. Or we create a link or a resource, whatever. But that's the idea. So please don't use lifecycle callbacks for business logic or events. It's just about how you reconstruct and deconstruct the objects, nothing else. This one is a bit bigger. Avoid auto-generated identifiers. Um, this means no auto-increment IDs. Uh, this is a bit bigger because pretty much everyone is using auto-increment IDs, right? Anybody using them? I suppose so. Yeah, really common. Um, auto-generated IDs are awesome. They give us a sequence, they're transactional. I mean, there's advantages in using them. But first of all, we can't do bulk inserts. So you give me 100 entities, now I have to insert all 100 entities. And if your field for the identifier is mapped as auto-generated, then I have for every one of those operations, run it, get the last insert ID, put it in the entity. Run the next one, get the insert ID, put it in the entity, and so on. So you're denying bulk inserts, which is something that we are working on. So the ORM doesn't support it, but just so you know, we will have that at some point. You can't really make multi-request transactions, so you can't create a user object, save it somewhere temporary. I mean, it's valid, it's still valid user object, save it somewhere and then persist it to the ORM in a later request, in a subsequent request. And your object is invalid until you persist it to the uh, ORM, to the entity manager or database. So this is kind of violating the first things that I said. So your object can't be used until it's on the database. That's kind of a big deal. Your object does not work without the DB. So it's not really self-contained state. It's state connected to a database now. So there's a very simple solution, which is well known to anybody using DDD approaches, which is pretty much to use UUIDs. Uh, a UUID is just a very big random number, 128 bits. Now, I don't know if the number is accurate, but if you kept generating like 100 million UUIDs per second, 
in a hundred years you would probably have a couple collisions yeah and at that point with those couple collisions you had so many other issues with the auto increment it is instead so this thing is kind of reliable just use it it's fine and this is all it comes down to that's all that's so simple and so much less complicated to think about instead of an auto increment id in the rm just use it i mean there's a library for it it's called ramsey uid it's kind of like the de facto uid for php works doesn't need to be anything more than that there are some customizations but i never needed them anyway so just use this it works auto increment is often abused for sorting and stuff like that use sequences use columns that are not mapped to the entities if you want or just add the daytime field or timestamp field to your entity and you put it in the constructor as well this is good enough for sorting as unless you want microsecond collision handling or whatever you can do that as well um, avoid derived primary keys uh, this is kind of like um, another pain point because if you're doing work with a relational database you want to normalize stuff which means if a user has the address as part of the primary key and the address needs to be in, a next, in another table then this means that you are referencing from the ID in the user the ID of the uh, address okay this is what a derived primary key is um, this is okay from a normalizing perspective but it's bringing so many problems from a domain perspective it's just complicated there's no real advantage in your domain in most cases in most scenarios you don't need it there may be scenarios where you may need it but we can discuss that but in most cases you just don't need it just add a uh, surrogate generated id and that's perfectly okay you are just normalizing for the sake of normalizing here and again we are not designing database first so remember you're first designing the use case the public api how it's saved that's a different problem deduplicating entries can be done via uh, stored procedures that check that your data is valid it can be done by listeners that indeed check if your data is valid before it goes to the database you can just do a query before creating the object you can do many things but having derived primary keys brings in a lot of problems also performance problems so ask yourself does your domain really need it if not then just don't do it same for composite primary keys use a unique index it works otherwise you're going to have to fetch by that composite primary key everywhere in your application and it just brings in more complication there may be advantages from a domain perspective in that case coded but that is so so rare okay think about the domain first then about the database normalization okay you can use a unique constraint you can use different approaches um, and it needs to make a, dif a difference in your domain in order to implement it like that uh, favor immutable entities um, this is kind of hard it doesn't work most of the times but when you can use it it brings in some real good advantages uh, what you can do is you can have append-only data structures, which is also really cool. So something like all the email addresses that a user had, you just make it an append-only data structure. You never delete the old email addresses. You know that this user had this email address. It's much, sim much, much simpler than having a log or other stuff like that. You just reference the latest one. So here's an example. You have a private message. We have from, to, message, and read which is who read it okay it's just a collection of who read it and then we have a constructor with all the stuff here and then we have read we pass in a user so this user reads this message okay so this is interesting from a security context because we know if somebody from xss or whatever somebody screwed up in the application layer and now managed to read our message this should be protected from a domain perspective but let's say that they got to read this message we just push new message read inside here and message read is just this it's an object user message constructor only there's nothing else in there if i want to know if the message was read i just look if the collection is empty or not and that's it you don't even need to know who read it if you would just want to make a check mark if somebody read it 
Immutable data is much simpler. It's cacheable forever. You're never modifying that entity. This means that you can just put it in a cache and hit that cache every time you access the ID of that particular entity. You're never going to change that. So the database is never hit again for that one if you have a decent caching mechanism. Immutable data is predictable. You kind of like can do analysis on it. You can throw it at something like Hadoop and whatever. Uh, and you can do analysis because it's append only. Uh, and yeah, you can do historical analysis indeed and see where it's going. You may look at event sourcing for that. Uh, it's something that is kind of becoming hip again. Uh, but the Java folks have been doing it for ages. Um, oh, actually, the C Sharp. I th I'm not sure who started it, but um, it's kind of an interesting approach. So what happens is that you just store what happens to your data and not what your data is, which is really interesting. So since we talked about immutable data structures and append only, what about soft deletes? Soft deletes are also something that a lot of people are using. Anybody tried the Jetmo extension for soft deletes? Yeah, it's a pain, <laughs> right? Soft deletes are an interesting concept because it was designed from an actual need. People want to store data and delete it, but not really delete it because that business use case in this corner of the application needs it later on. Or we don't know if people will need the data that was deleted. So soft deletes are a broken concept though, because it's the wrong solution for the problem. Uh, the idea is that you have to do everything in a single database. This comes from an age where everything was in a huge giant database. One database has to cover all the use cases of the application. So you store everything in there. Everything is constrained in there. All the rules of the business are in there. Uh, this is kind of problematic. Uh, but that's how we used to do things. But the problem leads to break immutability. So we are changing an existing entities when we delete it instead of actually deleting it. Instead of like saving in a log something about them. Uh, we are breaking data integrity because the foreign key still exists, but the data is actually not logically there. So the data is there in the database, but it has different meaning. So it changed meaning during it, its existence. Um, uh, yeah, we're breaking validity since we break integrity. Uh, and the point is that we can replace soft deletes with the more domain specific problems. So what happened um, to me is in this March, I was to going to a client and they were using soft deletes everywhere uh, because they had a need from a business perspective. So what they do is they deal with these big machines and machine is big like a building. Okay, they're building pieces of metal. So it takes a huge machine to to smash and compress these pieces of metal in the right shape or compose them together. What happens when a piece of metal is not needed anymore? They just archive this machine. They dismantle it and they put it somewhere in a storage. Now what they did is they soft deleted it instead. But you see that the business words for it is archived or stored or put on the side. We're not deleting it. You don't take a machine big like a as big as a building and delete it. You don't take an employee and delete it. You fire him eventually. He can be rehired eventually, but you don't delete people, okay? I mean, you can try. Um, so you see, we're replacing it with more specific terms. So we are adding the concept of archiving. So we are deleting it from here and creating it over there. And we may have an audit log for that. So we have a different concept, which is an archived machine different entity may contain the old machine or whatever. But we are replacing it with the mind specific concepts. Mapping driver choice. Again, ORM specific stuff. So for private packages, feel free to use annotations. There's no big deal in doing that. Uh, you don't need to go crazy with whatever mapping system to just keep your entities pure. At the end of the day, you need to build software that does what it does from a um, revenue perspective. If your software is not really generating revenue, either you're doing it for fun or you're going bankrupt and you're not realizing it. So annotations are perfectly fine for your private stuff that you don't want to show to the world. And anyway, dirty hacks, you can do it, okay? As long as you know that they are there, just avoid them when possible, obviously, but 
Annotations are fine. For public packages, please use the XML annotations. They're very stable. They're validated via XSD. So if you need to show it to the world, just make it clean first. Lazy or eager loading? Anybody using eager loading? No, that's fine. Okay. Eager loading is most of the times useless. Now the idea of eager loading is that when you select an entity, it's gonna do some automatic joins on its own, and then it's gonna select all the entities automatically. Now the ORM is a very advanced tool, but we are very far from getting the eager loads to work like that. So right now it's probably just causing additional queries. So just profile it and you'll find out that where it has the eager loading, you actually have additional queries, which may be a problem right now. On the other side, when you have extra lazy, you need to be careful. Uh, that means that you probably have a high risk area. So you have a collection that may become very big and you start having very high risk of just loading all the collection and crashing your application. Okay, so maybe that collection should not be there or maybe the transaction is too big. So just be careful when you have extra lazy. It may not necessarily be the right solution for your problem. There may be even issues with the transaction size here, as I said. Bidirectional association, if you remove the collection side of the association, you can generally try to remove the bidirectional associations. You keep them unidirectional, which is more performant and less cognitive load for you. So you only think of an association from one side of the problem instead of both sides and trying to keep consistencies in both entities, like the mapped by and the infer inverted by. Instead, yeah, you just have overhead if you implement it like that. Some cases are just like that. You have to do that. Like father, child, a father has, a ch has children and child has uh, one father. Uh, it may be difficult uh, depending on context, but sometimes the father doesn't know about his children. It's just one example, but it depends on your domain again. Depends on what kind of code you're writing, yeah, what the business problem is. Uh, so you just code the associations that are minimal for your domain logic to work. Okay, first, just one association on one side is much simpler than coding it on both sides and keeping consistency. If you need like to do some query where you select A and B, and you don't have the association in the right direction, hack some more DQL first. Okay, try solving it with DQL or even with SQL sometimes, but don't just add the association for DQL or for making the ORM easier to use. Make it a bit more complicated on that side and keep it simple inside the entities. Okay, um, custom repositories. Um, you have to kind of use them. Uh, if you have DDD in general, you um, are going to have your own interface for your repositories and your own classes. So uh, here we have just one example. We have a user repository and find your monthly subscription. It's a very specific method name, very easy to understand what it's doing, uh, very easy to understand when it's doing the wrong thing. And the other thing that you notice is that I'm not extending the doctrine repository stuff. I'm not extending it. This is part of my domain. So I'm not including framework stuff. In here, there may be a DQL, there may be stuff that we don't want to look at, but from the outside, there's no doctrine involved here. Okay. What I find especially useful is query functions. So this is better than repositories in my opinion. And it looks like this. So you have a final class, users that have a monthly subscription. See what I did there? Users that I have a monthly subscription and on the other side, I made it a class. I pass in the parameters via construct, the entity manager, and then it just acts as a function. First of all, this class has a single responsibility. Second, whoever uses this sees that this is, has an invoke and he will stop adding methods to it. This is more, again, of a psychological a result of it, but the point is they will stop adding more methods to it because it's very clear how this class should be used and it doesn't need to be used in more than one way. So you start having a directory with all these functions and you know exactly what kind of reports you have. Like I even wrote like classes like uh, number of registered users that didn't confirm their email address dot PHP. You know, it's a good function. It's simple, right? 
and you can even catch it and stuff like that. You can wrap it. It's a function. It's very easy to compose it. And since it has invoke, it doesn't even need an interface. Well, maybe that's to be discussed, but it's very simple to work with it. Repositories are services. The same goes for query functions. They are services. They act with input-output operations. They are kind of like acting um, with external systems and causing side effects. Uh, so since they are services, please don't use get repository to fetch the repositories. Instead, use your dependency injection container and pass them to your constructor or whatever you prefer there. Because get repository is a service locator. So get repository is probably never going to leave doctrine because it's so useful for tiny things and for small and quick works. But it's a service locator, okay? So it has its own disadvantages. And it causes all the same problems of a service locator. So you get a repository, but you expect that particular type of repository because you customized it. But the interface of this doesn't guarantee that. So you see, there's a lot of problems there. Plus you're passing the entity name to it. Very confusing there or at least confusing if you kind of want to find out what a repository looks like. Inject a repository instead. Constructor, passing stuff in the constructor. For repositories, another suggestion that I can get, give you is to separate my repository get and my repository find. So what you can do is you can do a find operation that can return null and a get operation that cannot return null. So if this one fails, you throw an exception. Looks like this. You have a blog post repository, get by slug. You expect to get one particular blog post by that slug. And when that fails, you throw an exception, blog post not found exception. And this means that from a front end perspective, you just catch the exception and convert it into 404. Instead, if you had it return a null eventually, you would have to check all the times. Did it actually return null? Do I need to show a 404 in every page that uses this repository? So the responsibility is moved up the chain. It's kind of simplifying things a lot. So you simplify the error, the error logic here. So I'm trying to get a bit faster because this is getting very long. Avoid two phase commit. Um, it's kind of simple. Like if you create an object graph, try to create it complete at first and try to avoid having two transactions connected together and doing uh, the save operation because you're going to have all the locking and optimistic locking or pessimistic locking problems. It's kind of simple. It's very simple. But if you have your UIDs and valid state all, at all times, you just can say save all this and it's going to work. And it's very simple. Keep transactions unrelated. When you have two services acting on a piece of the graph of your entity graph of your domain models, just have them have separate transactions. Your service A and your service B do things on the user object. Don't share the user object between them. Don't pass the user object from service A to service B. Instead, pass just the user ID. And if you really want to be sure that things are very independent, you even clear the entity manager between the two services interactions. This is a bit too far maybe, but it helps really because you're now passing IDs from one service to the other and you can disconnect services radically and you don't have like leaking state everywhere. Different boundaries, so service A and service B. Uh, invoicing and human resources, for example, different boundaries have indeed different transactions. An operation inside human resources and an operation inside uh, billing should not be connected between each other. They should maybe know each other by ID, but that's it. You just communicate by identifiers, value objects, but not by entity references, because you just mean that you're actually doing reusing the in-memory state that is not necessarily consistent. Uh, you can actually clear a lot more now because if you use the second level cache component, which is new from Doctrine or M2.5, you can just clear a lot of times uh, because uh, it's not going to go and ask the database all the time. You have cleared the data, it's just going to ask the cache again, give me the data again. So this is actually an operation that became much more efficient 
since Doctrine 2.5. Okay, keep normalization under control. As I said, normalization is not your domain. Normalization is what the DBA can talk about once you build your domain, okay? And only if it makes sense from a domain perspective. The point is keep the normalization freaks under control. There's a lot of people out there that don't, that take the first occasion to say, oh, this database is not optimized here or not optimized there. Don't optimize things unless they bring you some business value. Okay, so keep them under control. You may need to gag your DBA uh, or maybe just get him to understand what you're saying or what you need. So just don't be violent, please. Uh, <laughs> because academic and practical knowledge differ a lot here. We all build kind of like crappy stuff. I mean, if you're PHP developers, you know how many hacky things we build out there that kind of work and not the best solution, but they are an approximate one. We are approximating real world domains from business and we are approximating them into objects inside our relational database system. So don't try to make it perfect. Don't try to make everything super efficient. Make it work and make sure that it's correct first, not efficient. Efficient can be done later. What about performance? Performance can be achieved, but you have to profile. You need to know, first of all, the ORM, how it's structured. I have a different talk for that. What its components are. We're going to skip over that. That's ORM specific stuff. But the right ones are the ones that you want to look at. So you need to work DQL repositories and second level cache. That's where you want to look for slow stuff. You profile them and measuring is really the only way to achieve speed, okay? There are other talks about it. There's people doing only performance audits on this. So, you know, it can be done later. First implement it and then see how it works, but first be consistent because getting it right is the hardest part of modeling. To recap, domain first, see what your business does, build the public API, Everything else is secondary, like how the database works, how the private state works, everything like that. That's secondary. Do not normalize without the need for it. DRM is actually denormalizing data for you or renormalizing it for you when it loads and saves from SQL queries. So it's actually doing a lot of this kind of work. If you keep that kind of work very minimal because you already have kind of a, normal, a denormalized structure, this makes it easier for DRM. And it makes it easy also for you to understand on the database side where stuff is going. Don't normalize until it brings a business value for you. Otherwise, you're just making more problems that you're actually, than you're actually solving. Consider using da uh, different databases. You don't need to stuff everything in a single database. The ORM is not solving all the problems. You have to use SQL sometimes. You have to use other tools sometimes. Don't use the ORM to solve every problem in your application. And very, very important, transactional data is not reporting data. Transactional data is what you load in the web page. The other stuff is what comes out in reporting and stuff that takes ages to load in other applications. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any questions? Sure. Okay, so the question is about eager loading. I have to repeat it for the others. Um, what is an alternative to eager loading since eager loading is not the ultimate solution? So eager loading is obviously not a silver bullet. Um, there are the solution to fixing kind of eager loading when you need it um, is using called uh, something called fetch joins. So DQL has this feature called fetch joining. So you can say select and you give it Instead of one entity, you select two entities over an association. And what the ORM will do is it will create a join query and hydrate the data from the joined entity into the first entity. So that's what you do. There's a fetch join mechanism. Plus I blogged about it. If you need a lot of associations hydrated, then you use fetch join, a hack around fetch join, but it's performance optimization. Instead, if you use eager loading, then the risk is very high that the ORM is not understanding what you want to do. And it will just like say, oh, this needs to be eager loaded. So after I loaded it, I'm just going to do a lot of queries to load it. 
This is what happens with eager loading a lot of times. So it's really hard that the ORM will, it, it's really rare that the ORM grocks it correctly there and just automatically joins something for you. It's a very risky operation. So look up fetch joins in the documentation. Mm -hmm. If you do eager load, loading, it just does like a second query that does where in with IDs. Yeah. But that's not bad because. No, that's, that's not bad. Yeah. That's exactly what you do also with the DQL system. Uh, you can use the fetch join system, which is just going to one query. But if you do. If you need to associate more than. If you need to join in more than one association, and more than one association is a. Then you start having a lot of results from the permutations. Uh, so you need to do multiple queries and rehydrate, but uh, that's trivial. You just add like five lines of code to your uh, repository method and you can optimize that. But for a single association or for two one association, you just fetch join them all and that's fine. And it does it in one query instead of like two. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. 